Not happy. As of today, we're not even 10% into the 2020s and our dearest friend Emperor M has already gifted us with a serious contender for the worst movie of the decade in form of one, Artemis Fowl. In a nutshell, Artemis Fowl is a new Disney wannabe franchise starring blockbuster that they made for over a hundred million dollars and it was supposed to hit theaters in early 2020 until Disney got lucky and received an excuse to put it on their streaming service instead. The reason I say lucky is because had this movie actually hit theaters it would have been an absolute international financial travesty. Because exaggerations aside, this might very well be the dumbest, most idiotic, most nonsensical quote-unquote movie there is. You might say Artemis Fowl was written for children, but the level of dumb we're talking about here, it was more like it was written by an actual child and not the genius kind. Just to give you some sense of the level of intelligence in play in Artemis Fowl, here's a couple examples of what you can expect. When there's a time freeze that freezes everyone and everything, one single record player still keeps spinning for no explained reason just so that the scene has music. When we have an evil villain calling to tell our hero Artemis Fowl to go find a mysterious MacGuffin, find the, so you will never see him again. the movie then feels the need to remind us of this exact same thing literally two and a half minutes later as if we all had Alzheimer's. They know we have the Aculos. The voice on the phone told you to find it. Pigetti. That's right, but it's called spaghetti. And then of course there's my absolute favorite moment in the entire film. You'll have to keep me here forever. If that's what you want. You'll never get away with this. My people will come for me. That's what I hoped you'd say. Basically, here our hero Artemis has captured this fairy girl and locked her up in a cell and then after playing hardball with her, he slides this slut shot in her face in order to end the conversation in a cool, badass way. But it's like, dude, the cell is made of chicken wire, she can still talk and see through it. It's like the slut doesn't have any... <laughs> But since going through every dumb thing in this movie means that we'd be here for 90 minutes, let's instead cut to the source of all this stupidity and identify the core problem that caused this thing to become what it is. That problem being that Artemis Fowl is the kind of film that delivers information to the audience without ever backing it up in any way. In other words, it tells you something and then expects you to buy into it and care about it just because it tells it to you. Because in the eyes of Artemis Fowl, every person watching is an app absolute gullible moron. And while we have talked about this insulting style of filmmaking before, the truth is that I've never seen it done in such an arrogant, offensive way. So here's the plan. We'll find out how exactly this style of idiotic, insulting filmmaking ended up destroying this entire movie, in terms of character as well as the plot. And then finally we'll examine one specific sequence to highlight just how idiotic and insulting it all actually gets. So yeah. First off, a major reason behind why nothing in this movie works or was ever even going to work is because we never get to care about any of the characters. And that's because instead of showing us who the characters are or why we should care about them, the movie just tells us who they are and expects us to believe that and care just because it tells us to do so. Because in its eyes, we are all gullible idiots. Take our hero Artemis for example. The main person defining gist with Artemis is that he's a kid genius, the mastermind Einstein of our time. The smart hardest person you'll ever meet. And the movie is pretty upfront about it. And make no mistake, the kid is the best. Do not underestimate the kid. The kid's plan was fiendishly clever. The school, you see, he just didn't need it. But when the movie begins, what does it actually do to establish Artemis as a kid genius? Well, when he was seven, he beat European chess champion Evan Rishogi in five moves. When he was nine, he won the architectural competition to design the Dublin Opera House. When he was ten, he cloned a goat and named it Bruce. Yeah, it just says that Artemis has done all these ingenious things without ever actually showing him do any of them. And so now, there's a bit of an issue. In the very next scene where we have Artemis acting like a cocky, arrogant mastermind who's above school and everyone in it, we've never actually seen him do anything that would back this superior attitude up and so it just comes off as unjustified and instantly makes us dislike him. I hold several people in the very highest esteem. Who for example? Albert Einstein. His theories were usually correct. 
The only establishing action we see Artemis performing at the start is when he shows us that he's a hella lit surfer, which I somehow fail to see having any connection with being a kid genius. The first big showcase of Artemis's genius comes at the 20 minute mark, when his dad has been kidnapped and he has to use his big brain to find his dad's hidden journal. And here's how he does it. He read the same poem to me every night before bed, and every time he left, may the road rise up to meet you, may the wind be always at your back. It's known as the Irish blessing. It's a journal. It's Todd's journal. <laughs> There you go, Artemis deduces that the Irish poem his dad has been telling him every single night before bed might actually be a clue and then he looks for that poem book in the bookshelf and it turns out to be his dad's hidden journal. Oh wow, a true ingenious mastermind, no question. And I kid you not, that's pretty much the only establishing showcase of Artemis's big brain. After that, he goes and makes these insanely convoluted plans just because he sees a picture in a book or he spouts out incredibly detailed information he has no way of knowing. But rest assured, all of this is totally justified because Artemis is a real criminal mastermind. Not because he does anything to establish himself as massively smart or a criminal, but just because, uh, you know. I'm Artemis Fowl, and I'm a criminal mastermind. Another good example is Artemis' dad. Right away, the movie informs us that the dad is an obsessed workaholic who's always away from home, which has played a big role in Artemis becoming such an isolated, self-centered loner. Passion with his son on the rare occasions when he wasn't away from home. Your father and his mysterious absences from home. But then right away, once we go home from school, just guess who's there? Yeah, the dad. As in, the father who is never home is home the very first time we go there. And it's like, you're telling us one thing, but then you're showing us the exact opposite. If you want us to believe and invest in what you're saying, then the dad should only now arrive home and then leave almost immediately. Because if you just show the dad being home already and that Artemis isn't even that excited about it, we have no reason to care when he then says that he's going away again. We have no reason to doubt that he'll be back soon like he says, because he's been pretty pretty reliable so far. And also, by the way, if the father is always gone from home, then how come he's been able to tell that poem clue to Artemis every night before bed? Like, none of this makes any sense. And I know that's just a couple examples, but this is pretty much all you can expect here. We have hero introductions where we learn nothing about the hero save for their race. We have heroes who just pop in out of nowhere as if they had been there all along because that's what the movie says is going on now. We have an evil villain who never does does anything evil, aside from one kidnapping, which is the exact same thing Artemis does. Even when a character does show us their personality through their actions, they still fail to establish their physical abilities before they are used by the plot. All in all, most of the time, the only basis you have for knowing and caring about these characters is that it is what you are told to do, you idiot. Friend, mentor, bodyguard. Ten years of martial arts training in Kyoto, seven years of weapons. It's made it twice as strong and ten times as mad. A dealer of antiques and rarity. Our skin is completely fireproof. Very tech genius and centaur. You don't respect anyone enough to treat them as an equal. The other half of this problem affects the plot, in that the movie presents itself to be this amazing adventure with incredibly strong goals and stakes and urgency, but only on the foundation that that is what it says it is. Essentially, the basis of the plot here is that Artemis' dad gets captured by this evil villain who then demands Artemis to find this supernatural MacGuffin called the Aculus, which is some kind of a magical object of power, and it is a big deal. Until the Aculus is safely returned, our entire civilization is at risk. Domovoy knew the stakes couldn't be higher. He knew how dangerous the Aculos can be. The most precious artifact in our civilization. And the fate of both of our worlds was in the hands of young Artemis Fowl. But as you might have already guessed, nothing about this plot basis is ever actually established. I mean, to be fair, we do know that the dad has been kidnapped, but that's about it. As for the MacGuffin itself, we have never seen it being used or witnessed the powerful destruction it can cause, so we have no reason to 
think of it as this big important world affecting thing. We don't even know what it is or what it does, so mainly we're just confused as to what it is we're trying to find. The only plot related detail we do know is that the MacGuffin is hidden somewhere in Artemis's house. Not because of any real established evidence, but just because… It appears to be nowhere in this house, and yet it has to be. So already the main basis of the plot falls apart right at the starting line. But once we get to see how it all actually plays out, it gets even more nonsensical. Because with everything that happens, the movie gives no logical foundation for it to happen, but just expects us to buy into it because according to it, it is what happens. The overall plan of Artemis is to use fairies to help draw in a dwarf who can find the hidden MacGuffin for him, because he sees a picture of that in a book. And already there's a bit of an issue here. An issue that at this point the movie has not yet established that Artemis believes in fairies or magical creatures. You believed in the goblins and you believed in the trolls. I'm not a kid anymore, Dad. Who is this? Is this a hoax? If you have my father, I want proof. But the fairies are a myth. None of this is actually true. Time to believe in fairies. But they're not real. Are they? So far we've only seen Artemis state that he's too old to believe in magic and then start to question whether it is real or not. So it is a bit strange that he would then suddenly base his entire plan of saving his dad exclusively on the existence of magical fairies when at this point he's not even sure they exist. But then again that is what happens so… <sighs> Cool. The first step of Artemis' plan is to capture this fairy girl he knows will come to this big tree near his house, because that's what he says his dad's journal conveniently said would happen. And what do you know? It's exactly what happens. He captures the fairy girl just like planned. And then he's also surprised that fairies exist, which is a bit weird considering his plan requires them to exist. Then he locks the fairy girl in his basement and waits for the fairy army to come save her, and then forces the army to wait outside his house by not letting them come in. And the reason why the fairies can't just come in is because, um... I'll give you 15 minutes. And in case you're thinking of storming the house, no fairies are allowed to enter it while I'm alive. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Right, Artemis says to the fairies that they can't enter his house, and so then the fairies are like... Mission failed. We'll go next time. As to why that is or what the fairy army's plan then was to begin with, I have no idea, but it is what it is. And so then, like Artemis planned, the fairies invite this dwarf robber to dig his way into the house, despite us never having seen him dig anything before. And as the dwarf does so, he somehow accidentally digs himself up onto the second floor and finds a secret safe behind a painting and cracks it open to find the MacGuffin inside. As to why any of this happens when he was just supposed to get the fairy girl from the base or how it's even physically possible to dig your way from underground up onto the second floor of a house, I genuinely do not know. But it is what happens, so I guess that's what it is. And so now Artemis then finally has the MacGuffin, but he still can't use it due to the fact that he's human. Not because we've seen bad things happen to humans who use it, but instead because… You have to try. I thought I could, but I can't. Holly said if any human uses it, they'll die. Then the fairy girl comes in to use the MacGuffin, even though she's never been established to know how to use it to teleport the dad back home, even though the teleportation effect has never been established, and then the movie just ends. And there you have it, truly an incredible high stakes adventurous plot. Never mind the fact that we have a villain who does absolutely nothing to show what they want or why, and a hero who barely even leaves his freaking house, and pretty much nothing that makes any sense whatsoever. That's what the movie says it is, so that's what the movie is, dummy. Okay, so now that we've explained the problem of this movie presenting information without justification and the derogatory effect on characters and plot that carries, I want to highlight one specific sequence to really showcase just how frequently and insultingly the movie does it. That sequence being the fairy beach invasion section. Basically, here Artemis has captured the fairy girl, and so now the fairy army is then coming to rescue her. And the way the sequence begins is this. Artemis? Dom? It's like the whole world is ending. The fairies are doing it. 
They're creating a time freeze! Already, there's a bunch of things very wrong. Firstly, why are there surveillance cameras at the house when we've never seen any cameras before? Secondly, why are the cameras just filming rocks and water? Thirdly, why is this girl watching the surveillance footage right at this decisive moment when she has never done so before? Fourthly, why does the butler say the whole world looks to be ending when it looks pretty normal to me? Fifthly, how does Artemis have all this info about the fairy time freeze technology when we've never seen Seen him getting it. I mean, the last time we saw the fairies use the time freeze, there was no storm at all. And that's just the first 10 seconds. Next up, there's the whole time freeze bubble itself. It makes no sense. The last time we saw the fairies use it, it froze everything inside it. But now it suddenly freezes everything outside it. Okay. And if it can't do that, then what's the reason for the bubble anyway, when you can just apparently freeze the entire world? And more than that, what's the point of using the time freeze here in the first place? You already established that there's nothing near Artemis's house. Tara and Island. I checked the maps. The only human habitation anywhere near it is Foul Manor. So then, if there's nobody around to see you and you for some reason don't want to freeze Artemis, why bother using the time freeze at all? I mean, the only civilian here is this random Fisher guy who I think is here to begin with because the storm from the time freeze pushed him here. And regardless, you could have just easily wiped his memory, which is something we already established you can do. So like, huh? Also, how can the fairies and their ships move in the time freeze in the first place? Why does the time freeze push water away? Why is- Hey, you shut up, kid. It looks cool deal with it. Next up, the full fairy army shows up and prepares to move in. You know, despite the fact that earlier the movie made a big deal about all the fairy soldiers having gone away on a mission, which is why the girl was sent up in the first place. And so now, Artemis and his butler take the girl's weapon to use it. And since at this point we have never seen that weapon being used, the movie throws in this little moment to establish it as something that can turn into a sword. But then, when they go out and use the weapon, guess what happens? That's right, they use the weapon as a shield and a gun and a bow and who knows what, but never as a sword. As in, the movie establishes this weapon to be one thing, but then uses it as every other kind of thing imaginable. I mean, I get that it can change form or whatever, but none of this was ever introduced. And it's like, why? Why couldn't you just first show that the weapon can do all this? Why couldn't you just first show Artemis and the butler learning to use it? Why didn't you use it as a sword? Oh wait, I guess you can see one frame of a sword there. Or no, is that the bow or whatever. Anyway, then we get to the point where for some reason the fairies can't go in the house and so they call in the dwarf to dig inside. Never mind the fact that they seem to be able to dig just fine themselves. And again, none of this makes any sense. First off, why does the dwarf have to start digging all the way from the beach? Scratch that, why does he have to start digging at all? Why can't he just, you know, walk in through the door or break a window? I mean, Look, there's a bunch of windows right there in the basement where the girl is kept. I understand that this digging looks cool and that it has to happen so that the dwarf accidentally somehow digs his way up onto the second floor to accidentally find the safe nobody knew about, but like, you can't just have all this stuff happen without any logical reason and then expect me to just swallow it as is. Like, I'm not a moron. Then, toward the end, the time freeze bubble starts malfunctioning and apparently becomes this incredible danger to everyone. Elastication and space grabs coming your way. For your own sakes, get out of there now and get home safe. This time freeze is gonna blow! Holly, this is your last chance. You can't save him. Just get out of there now. As to why that happens when it hasn't ever been shown to happen before in any way, or why they don't just shut the whole thing off, I do not know. And what I also do not know is that when it finally does go boom, why in the F does nothing bad actually happen to anyone? Artemis, along with all his friends for some unexplained reason, is totally fine. Not even a scratch. Um, excuse me, what? And like, why doesn't... <laughs> you know what, I don't care. I'm done. Like, I'm done. Bye.